shiny um, next generating sequencing methods, we are able to generate a vast amount, hundreds of thousands of uh, orthologous uh, loci for file genetic inference. Now, when we're doing gene tree inference, not all of those uh, of those loci will actually uh, concur with another, and there might actually be a lot of um, um, incongruence between those between those gene trees. And there are many. There is a number of biological reasons, such as incomplete lineage sorting, that are actually underlying such uh, this, uh, this uh, incongruence. Now, by incorporating a multi-species coalescent uh, into species tree estimation, we can try to accommodate this heterogeneity in, in gene tree signal. Um, but full coalescent-based methods such as uh, Starbeast or BEST are computationally extremely strenuous uh, and they are not very um, applicable to many of our phylogenomic sized data sets. So a number of, uh, a shortcut has been developed called summary coalescent methods where you first infer the, the gene trees and based on that distribution of gene trees you infer the species tree. Now there has been uh, a few articles that have been uh, criticizing this method and mainly for the reason that summary coalescent methods fail to account for uncertainty in the gene tree estimate. These authors actually um, uh, favor the concatenation method for these reasons. However, I don't think that we should go back to a concatenation method. We should actually try to, with, with those large data sets, we should try to characterize some of these issues. Um, and I think the main objective from this is trying to um, question how we can assess or avoid uncertainty in those gene tree estimates in a coalescent framework. Now the group of um, charismatic little lizards that I'm working on is our lizards within the Cryptoblepharus genus. There are approximately 25 Australian species, and I think this is an extraordinarily well group to actually try to, to, um, to test some of these uh, approaches. Because it's likely a challenging that there's likely a challenging radiation within Australia, and there's might likely a second or a first radiation that's a, that's a little bit less challenging because the number of species and the time of divergence in some of these species are longer. So I'm happy that Jason presented before me and um, uh, told, uh, explained a, a few of our methods. Um, I used a similar method using action capture, uh, and whereas Jason was kind of focusing on more the biomedical side of things, I'm going to focus more on the on the different side of, of our uh, of our approach. Now, in this in this presentation, uh, for all those species, I use a single individual per species. The only thing I want to highlight for the, uh, on the biomedical side of things is that. Exon, um, alignments are a very important part of phylogenetic inference. That is true for Sanger sequence data, but for sure that's also true for uh, next generation sequence data. So therefore we spend a, a quite an extraordinary amount of time in trying to get high quality sequence alignments. Because in Sanger data, what we did was we generated alignments and then we did a visual inspection of all those alignments. Now with 1,500 to 3,000 loci, this is very challenging and, um, well, it would take a lot of my time actually. So we tried to <laughs> set up a, a, a pipeline that actually used those, uh, the, the, the protein coding character of axons and did a, a, um, um, a quality con control based on the protein uh, coding um, um, uh, sequences. Um, now, as we have seen as well in, during these meetings, is that um, missing data is also an important part that might affect your species tree inference. Um, and what this method, or what this pipeline is doing, is that it will, will give you output where it will also try to quantify the amount of missing data you have. So you can have a data set with no missing data, you can have 10% missing data, 20% missing data, and you can repeat those analysis based based. Um, you can repeat your inferences based on these different data sets and see how much consistency there is between uh, methods. So the, the paper is currently in, in review, um, but you can already find the, the scripts on my uh, GitHub and see if you can want to try it out. So for in this presentation, I've only used complete sequence data. So there's no missing data regarding species or within alignments. So first I want to show you actually the concatenation tree, and not necessarily because I want to show you the, um, uh, I want to focus on the concatenation part, but to show you how difficult this, uh, this genus radiation actually is. So as you can see, there's based on, this, on, the, on, the, on the concatenated rexamel tree of um, 1361 loci, Indeed, we find two radiations. Here's the first one, and here, likely, is the second one. And then you can see that the internode uh, branch lengths in this, in this second radiation, there's a number of uh, branch lengths that are incredibly short. And these are exactly the places where we expect to find a lot of potential incongruence between gene trees. So, a lot of um, low uh, challenging nodes, basically. Whereas in the first radiation, this is less, uh, likely, less of an issue. 
Now, to come back to our objective, which is how can we assess or avoid G3 estimation uncertainty in a CoLab framework, I will first focus on the, the um, uh, on the first approach, and this is to assess the statistical consistency of our gene tree estimate um, in a COLAB, summary COLAB framework. Now the question then, the question then first is, how do we quantify the consistency of our gene tree estimation, right? Now, what I used is a method developed by um, Salikos, Sanatakis, and Rokas, the Greek voice. <laughs> um, and what they've been doing is that they've been actually trying to assess the consistency, but, oh, the, consist the, the similarity between trees um, with, a, with a new uh, um, um, value, basically. So what I've been doing is that you, you take a single alignment, you infer the most likely gene tree, for example, based on 10 or 100 replicates, and then you have to do 100 bootstrap replicates over that same alignment. Now within, each, uh, within, the, within your uh, most likely um, estimate of the gene tree, you take each bipartition and you see how often that bipartition is found within each of your bootstrap replicates. Now, it does this for every single bipartition and it will give you a value of how, how frequently that bipartition is found across all your bootstrap replicates. Now, the, the, the rationale behind it is that if you would have a, a, a low resolution gene tree and you would have a lot of uh, potential polytonies, is that you would expect by, uh, there might be a lot of optimal trees in that, that sense, and if you look at it across your bootstrap replicates, it, it's very likely that you will find alternative um, uh, bipartition, a lot of conflicting bipartition across your bootstrap replicates. So based on this, you can get a, kind of an estimation on how consistently that, that gene tree is actually recovered that you have inferred. Now what I did is I ranked those, uh, I ranked those, uh, all those low side based on their, on their, um, on their value for uh, uh, consistency. And then I, I conducted um, an astral species tree, so that's a summary coalescent method, on subsets of those data sets with an increasing amount of, um, uh, of loci, but loci with decreasing information content. Now what you can see here is, I want you to focus on two things. Firstly, that indeed a lot of those nodes that we saw in the concatenation method that were hard to resolve are also hard to resolve in the, in the, in the summary coalescent method. So this is based on 400 of those ranked gene trees, with 100 boots of replicates per uh, uh, gene tree. Um, and then the next slide I'll show you actually how this will change, for example, if you add 1,200 gene trees, so that's almost my complete data set. And what you see actually is that if you add non-informative loci, or loci with, yeah, with, a, with an inconsistent estimation of the gene tree, is that actually that you see that the nodes that were consistently resolved are the same ones that are being consistently resolved, and the ones that are kind of um, were, uh, were unresolved remain unresolved. Another way to visualize this is looking at Robinson Fold's distances between, um, between your trees. And what that basically means is that I here on the x axis I have data sets with number of genes, and on the y axis I have the Robinson Fold distance between the tree based on that data set. So, for example, here based on 200, uh, 300 loci. And then um, compared to the to the to uh, the inferred tree based on my complete data set. Now in the blue you have you have you see the the part where I ranked the gene trees, and in red you see uh, sorry, uh, vice versa. In blue you'll see the data set where I randomly picked the genes. So irregardless of their information content or the consistency of the gene tree, <coughs> whereas the red ones I actually rank those. And what you see is that all the action happens within the first 200 to 300. Um, loci, where if you randomly pick 300 loci out of your complete data set, is that the, in, the, in the beginning, there's actually a, a lot of uh, incongruence between your inferred species tree based on a small data set or based on your complete data set. But if, once you hit kind of like 300, 400 loci, and as we just saw in comparing those two trees, is that you actually, you don't hit a lot of, uh, you don't get a lot of increased um, um, accuracy of your of your uh, species tree estimate. You cannot hit the most optimal tree where you don't see any more uh, an increase in uh, incongruence, but you also don't see any further nodal support. The reason why this this uh, Robin's fault system doesn't go back to zero is because there are a number of those polytomies, so they will just randomly shift. <coughs> now the second part, how we can potentially try to avoid, avoid a gene tree estimation uncertainty, is by to avoid gene tree estimation at all. So there's has been some uh, there is a method of, uh, developed where they actually try to use biallelic SNP markers in trying to estimate the species tree. Um, so here I'll show you the SNP species tree based on 4,983 SNPs 
which I randomly sampled from each single locus. So basically you would give the metadata so that I get an alignment and I get an X number of, of uh, polymorphic sites within that alignment, and I randomly pick a single SNP from each of those, from each of those loci. Now you see that the SNP tree also doesn't uh, increase any, um, uh, I don't get a free result tree, and there's still a lot of uncertainty there, there actually as well. But if we actually calculate the number of parsimony informative sites, you will see that actually the, the number of informative SNPs decreases significantly. And the problem with this is, is that 67% of the SNPs that you randomly select are actually only um, um, occurring mutations that occur at the terminal branches. So those are SNPs that you select that don't have any information on some of those uh, relationships that you're interested in. And that's actually, if you already think about, you know, that I have 14, over 1,400 plus SNPs, then actually the numbers of ones that have information about the, this whole, the, 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 the part that are parsimony informative are 582. And not only on the, the problem is here in the terminal branches, it's also that if you have a lot of, um, a lot of divergence between some of your uh, plates, is that a lot of that SNP real estate is actually already being taken up here by this differentiating between your two major radiations. So therefore, I, I actually already exclude an out group, because if I exclude an out group, the number of parsimony informed SNPs would be even decreasing. So what this will result in is that actually if you repeat your SNP sampling, so you randomly sample a single SNP again from each single locus, and you repeat your SNP analysis, is that you actually can get incongruent uh, topologies that can wildly differ and actually can be highly supportive because the number of SNPs that you select there or that are parsimony informative for those nodes is very, very low. Now the question is how we can bypass this. Um, and um, one, one way is to actually um, uh, potentially try to only select parsimony form to snipe, snips, snipes, snips. <laughs> but then this will bias some of your relationships and we need to develop some sort of asset payment bias correction. But uh, yes, I have no clue how to do that. But um, in conclusion, <coughs> if we think about a summary coalescent um, uh, approach, is that the informative loci will contribute most to your species reestimation, and adding a non-informative loci does not re result in well-supported topolog topological changes. So that doesn't mean that you um, increase your notice by adding an X amount of loci. It also doesn't mean that you are losing any resolution or introduce phylogenetic noise, as has been suggested. Now, secondly, is that yeah, when you do a, sn a SNP-based analysis, I think it's very worthwhile actually to calculate to estimate. How, um, how consistent your uh, estimated species, species tree is by doing repeated SNP sampling again and repeating that analysis. Now lastly, I think in general what can be um, concluded from this is that it's critical to evaluate the loci that are targeted, for example, the informativeness of the loci, or for example, if you use SNPs, the, 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 the SNPs that you are using. And with that, I would like to thank the Moritz Lab, and especially my co-authors on this work, uh, Sally Potter, Jason Bragg, and Fred Moritz and a whole bunch of other people on the left, and the funding organization, and especially the museums as well. Thank you very much.